नमस्कार आई डॉक्टर कपिल शर्मा करेंटली वर्किंग एज एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर एट इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ मैनेजमेंट स्टडीज देवेला विश्वविद्यालय इंदौर इन दिस सेशन विल फोकस ऑन जनरल प्रिंसिपल्स ऑफ इंश्योरेंस डियर फ्रेंड्स द एंटायर हिस्ट्री ऑफ ह्यूमन स्पीशीज इज अ क्रोनोलॉजी टू एक्सपोजर ऑफ रिस्क एंड ऑफ द एफर्ट्स टू डील विद दम ऑल दो इट इज परहैप्स एन एग्जैजरेशन टू क्लेम दैट द एंटायर अर्लीएस्ट प्रोफेशन वॉज रिस्क मैनेजमेंट बट इट कैन बी आर्ग्यूड दैट सिंस फ्रॉम द डॉन ऑफ द एग्जिस्टेंस ह्यूमन स्पीशीज हैव फेस द प्रॉब्लम ऑफ सर्वाइवल नॉट ओनली as individuals was as species the entire human concern was the quest for security and avoidance of risk that threatened their existence our continued existence is a testimony to the success of our ancestors in risk management it is a hard fact that despite so much of technical advancements we have not been able to devise any method that can completely eliminate risk from our life what we can do is simply manage risks risk management is the next wave of solutions to the challenges of governing modern businesses generally all the risk management methods or techniques are directed towards minimizing the losses broadly there are five categories in which various methods or techniques for risk management can be put into they are risk avoidance risk reduction risk retention risk transfer and risk sharing one of the ways to manage risk is insurance as an economic product insurance involves not only risk transfer but also sharing of risk reduction sharing refers to pooling of common risk among a group pooling within a large group facilitates risk reduction which is a decrease in the total amount of uncertainty present in the particular situation further insurance accomplishes risk reduction by combining under one management similar risks facing objects so that the aggregate losses to which the insured are subjected becomes predictable within narrow limits thus overall risk for the group is reduced friends before i move on to the main agenda of this session that is general principles of insurance i wish to devote few minutes for discussing the definition of insurance and its basic terminology as it will help us in better understanding of general principles of insurance well there is no single definition of insurance as it has been defined in number of ways depending upon the stream where it is used from a pure financial perspective it is defined as a substitution for a small known loss which is the insurance premium for a larger unknown loss which may or may not occur from a social perspective it is defined as a social device whereby the uncertain risks of an individual may be combined in a group and thus made more certain a small contribution made by the group members towards a fund out of which those who suffer losses may be reimbursed whereas from a legal aspect it is defined as a contract by which one party for a compensation called premium assumes certain risks of the other party and promises to pay him or his nominee a certain ascertainable sum of money on happening of a specified contingency now let's understand some basic insurance terminology to start with the term insured this refers to the party or individual who seeks protection against a specified risk and is entitled to receive the payment for the losses likewise the term insurer refers to one who promises to pay for the losses and receives the premium from the insured next a premium is a payment 
which the insurer receives from the insured. A policy document is a document that contains terms and conditions of the contract and is issued by the insurer. Insured sum is the sum for which risk is insured or the face value of the policy. This is the maximum liability of the insurer towards the insured. Another term is beneficiary. Beneficiary is an individual or individuals to whom the policy proceeds will be paid on the happening of event. The next term is loss which commonly refers to a state of being without something that one had earlier. Loss can further be classified into two categories direct loss and indirect loss. For example, fire destroying house is a direct loss for the owner of the house whereas expenses incurred on living in an another house is indirect loss. Friends, like accounting, insurance is also based upon certain general principles which are universal and cannot be violated under any circumstances. These are broadly nine principles and they are principle of cooperation, principle of probability, principle of inertia of large number, principle of utmost good faith, principle of insurable interest, principle of indemnity, principle of subrogation, principle of contribution and principle of proximate cause. I will now discuss each and every principle in detail. Please note that they are not in the order of priority of import or importance. I will start with the principle of cooperation. If a person is providing for his own losses, it is not insurance because in insurance, the loss is shared by a group of persons who are willing to cooperate. The society or by a group by accumulating funds guarantees payment of a certain amount at the time of loss to any member of the society or group. This accumulation of funds and charging share from the members in advance is the job of insurer. It is the duty and responsibility of the insurer to collect adequate funds from the members of the society or group and to pay them at the time of happening of the event. Thus, the share of loss contributed by each member in the form of premium. All the insured give a premium to join any particular scheme of insurance. In this way, all the insured are cooperating to share the loss of an individual by paying a premium in advance. The next principle is principle of probability. Friends, the loss in the shape of premium can be distributed on the basis of theory of probability. Using the theory of probability, the chances for losses are estimated in advance so as to fix the amount of premium to be charged. Since the degree of loss depends upon number of factors, these factors are analyzed before determining the amount of loss. Further, the degree of uncertainty of loss is converted into a reasonable degree of certainty. This ensures that the insurer will neither suffer loss nor will make gains. Thus, the insurer ends up charging only that much amount which is adequate to meet the anticipated losses. In a nutshell, theory of probability helps in predicting the chances of losses and also what the amount of losses will be. Now, moving on to the next important principle, which is principle of inertia of large numbers. The law is applicable to each and every field of insurance and is applied while calculating probability. According to this law, larger the number of data and the better and more practical would be the findings of the probability. Moreover, the principle is based upon basic presumption that past events will occur in future with the same inertia. Based upon this, the insurer taking into consideration past experience, present condition 
and future prospects fixes the amount of premium. Without premium, no cooperation is possible and the premium cannot be calculated with the, without the help of theory of probability and theory of law of inertia of large numbers. Hence, these two principles that are the principle of probability and inertia of large numbers are two important legs of insurance. The next important principle is the principle of utmost good faith. According to this principle, both parties that is the insured and the insurer must reveal to each other all material facts about the subject matter of the insurance which would influence each other's decision. This principle lays emphasis on the fact that insurance contract must be signed by both the parties in absolute good faith or trust. The insurer's liability gets void if facts submitted by insured about the subject matter of insurance are either omitted, hidden, falsified or presented in a wrong manner. Similarly, the insurer must provide all the information regarding the terms and conditions of the policy to the insured. Now, the question arises, what is the scope of material fact? What does it account for? Friends, material fact includes those facts which can influence the insurer's decision with respect to underwriting of risk or fixing of premium or the terms and conditions of the contract. Let me now broadly highlight facts that should be under all circumstances disclosed and they are facts which show that a risk represents a greater exposure than would be expected from its natural course for example, the fact that a part of building is being used for storage of inflammable material is a material fact and must be disclosed. Similarly, external factors that make risk greater than normal, for example, the building is located next to a warehouse, storing explosive material must also be disclosed. Further. Facts which would make the amount of loss greater than normally expected for. For example, there is no segregation of hazardous goods from non-hazardous goods in the storage facility. This should also be disclosed. In addition to these, other factors such as previous history of insurance, denial to cover risk by any other insurance company, earlier or special conditions imposed by the other insurers all account for material facts. Since it is very important aspect that the scope of material fact changes depending upon the type of insurance product. I will further elaborate it with help of example of different insurance products. In fire insurance, the construction of building and the nature of its use, whether it is a concrete building or a kacha house and whether it is being used for residential purpose or a warehouse, whether firefighting equipment is available or not, all such information account for material fact. In motor vehicle insurance, facts such as type of vehicle, the purpose of its use, its model, capacity, etc. are all material facts which the insured must disclose to the insurer. In marine insurance, type of packaging, mode of carriage, name of carrier, nature of goods, the en route, etc. are considered to be material facts. In personal accident insurance, the age, height, weight, occupation, previous medical history, habits such as drinking, smoking, etc. should be disclosed at the time of making the proposal. Similarly, in burglary insurance, nature of stock, value of stock, type of security, precautions taken are all material facts which cannot be hidden or misrepresented. Now, let us look at those facts which are of material nature but need not be disclosed explicitly. Like facts of law, everybody is deemed to know the law and hence provision 
of applicable law need not be disclosed explicitly. For example, vehicles carrying overloaded goods is legally banned. The transporter cannot take excuse that this was not told to him or he was not aware of this provision. Next, facts which lessen the risk. For example, the existence of a good firefighting system in the building is a must and is not necessary that be specifically mentioned to the insured. Similarly, facts of common knowledge. The insurer is expected to know the processes followed in a particular trade or industry, hence need not be told clearly. Further, facts which could be reasonably discovered. For example, the previous history of the insured. The insurer is supposed to have his in his records. Moreover, facts which the insurer's representative fails to notice. In case the surveyor of an insurer fails to notice hazardous features and reports details that are not withheld by the insured or concealed by him, then the insurer cannot be penalized. Let me now devote some time on breach of utmost good faith. It generally occurs in either two ways and they are misrepresentation and non-disclosure. Both misrepresentation and non-disclosure can be further classified into innocent and intentional. I will first discuss breach of utmost good faith due to misrepresentation. A breach of utmost good faith due to misrepresentation is considered to be innocent when a person states a fact in the belief or expectation that it is right but it turns out to be wrong. For example, while applying for a marine insurance, the insured states that the ship will leave on a specific date. But in fact, ship leaves on a different date due to unavoidable circumstances. Whereas, a breach due to misrepresentation is treated as intentional when the insured intentionally distorts the known information to defraud the insurer. The selfish objective is somehow to get the insurance cover or to get a reduction in the premium. For example, if an applicant of motor insurance states that the vehicle will be used for personal purpose, whereas the fact is that it is being used for commercial purpose. Now, I will discuss breach of utmost good faith due to non-disclosure. Like breach due to misrepresentation, breach of utmost good faith due to non-disclosure can also be classified into two categories, innocent and intentional. And breach of principle of utmost good faith due to non-disclosure is regarded as innocent when a person is not aware of the fact or when even though he is being aware of the fact does not appreciate its significance. For example, a proposer at the time of effecting the contract is has an undetected diabetes, therefore does not disclose it. Or an insurer had suffered from fits in his childhood, but he does not disclose this, unaware of the fact that people who have suffered it from it in the past are susceptible to such disease at a later age also. On the other hand, breach of principle of utmost good faith due to non-disclosure is treated as deliberate when it is done with a deliberate intention to defraud the insurer entering into a contract, which he would not have done had he been aware of that fact. For example, a proposer of a fire insurance hides the fact knowingly that he has an outhouse next to his building which is used as a store facility for highly inflammable material. After having discussed about how breach of utmost good faith can take place, I will now briefly discuss on ways to deal with when breach of utmost good faith is detected. Dealing with a breach will depend upon the nature of breach and when the breach is detected. Let me discuss it step by step. A contract becomes void from the very beginning if deliberate misrepresentation or non-disclosure is detected 
with the intention of misleading the insurer so as to get the insurance cover. To consider the contract void, the party must notify the offending party that breach has been noticed and as per the conditions of the contract, he is no longer governed with the terms of the contract agreed upon. In case the breach is discovered that a time of claim, insurer will refuse to honor his promise and will not pay the claim. This again occurs when there has been a deliberate breach. In case the breach is innocent but it is material to the fact, then the insurer may impose a penalty in the form of additional premium or continue with the contract. But if the breach is found to be innocent and is not material, the insurer can choose to ignore the breach and wave off the breach.